Welcome to First Presbyterian Church here in Shelbyville, Kentucky on this last Sunday of September. We're glad you are joining us for our digital worship and uh, we hope you are able to gather something from this um, service that helps you in your week to come and in your journey of faith. Next week, uh, I do want to make the announce that next week will be communion. Communion, and if you are viewing from home, you will need to have your grape juice and have your own bread and uh, join us for that communion. It will be later, put up later in the day, or probably later on Monday, because we're going to try to meet in person outside on the lawn that day at 11 o'clock for an abbreviated service with communion. It will be recorded and uh, we will place it up. We will put it up on our website and at our, on our Facebook page. Let us now turn to God in prayer. Lord, God of the world, you have revealed your will to all people and promised us your saving help. May we hear and do what you command so that the power of evil may be overcome by the gift of your healing grace. Then, O oh God of love, teach us to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and not to ask for any reward, save that of knowing that we will that we do your will. We pray all of this through your Son's name. Amen. Our first scripture lesson for the day, and we will have two today, comes from the letter to James, the letter of James, uh, chapter 3, verse 13. Listen carefully for the word of God. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your, good, that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. And from the book of the Exodus, starting with chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in on, on the earth beneath, or that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God for them. 
You know, when I was a little kid, when we got to the third commandment, and it said, Thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain, I thought that was simply you couldn't say the word God. We got, we got in trouble if we ever said, Oh my God. And sometimes, and one time, I was overheard saying that to one of my brothers. And I did get a pretty bad licking. That was what using the Lord's name in vain was for. In other words, you were calling out to God, but you had no particular reason for it. And that was good enough. I got a little older and then it, you threw it in with swearing. That's the same reasoning. And it pretty much didn't change. But it has a deeper meaning than just refraining from using God's name frivolously. In fact, actually for frivolous use is less, is less of a problem than when one uses it intentionally. And when I say intentionally, it's intentional misuse. Now let me give you an example. It's one that I, Pretty much we still, we know about the Crusades. Not sure that everybody knows how bad the Crusades were. We tend to gloss over that, or at least we did when I was a kid. But Crusades were called for by a Pope to cap recapture the Holy Land. And there were many reasons behind it. Very few of them had anything to do with spreading Christianity. And if it did, the Christianity they were spreading, well, if you want a good idea, there is always the movie Kingdom of Heaven with Orlando Bloom. Uh, it's a fairly good representation even if it does take some liberties with some history. But anyway, it's not very Christian when you take over the city and you slaughter every man, woman, and child in it, killing Muslims, the main constituents, Jews, who never left, who always lived there, and the Christians who lived there. Yes, Christians killing Christians. They just slaughtered everybody. That was in the Second Crusade, I think, or the First Crusade. There were three of them, and one of them the Crusaders didn't even go to the Holy Land. They went, they went over and sacked another Christian city, the city of Byzantium. They laid siege to it. And it was purely for economic gain. But all of that was done three times over many years and many dead. That was done all in the name of God. Now, if you think about that being the wrong use of God, God's name, that's what this third commandment means. I say third commandment. Really, the first three commandments are really just one commandment. It is. You're totally supposed to be focused on God. There's no separation or a place for God. God is the only place there is. Everything else in your life is supposed to fit in God, not you find a place to fit God in your life. And that's why all of those are in there together. The Lord is your God. There are no other gods out there. And so when you are acting and living as one of my, mine, you will act and, and live in a way that everyone will know who's your, whose you are. Yeah. If you live counter to that way, you will bring upon yourself uh, tragedy and uh, calamity. Uh, 
you know, that promise of, I'm going to, you're going to be punished, your children, it will be, even your children will be punished. That really is more of a, if you take down this direction and think you can partially follow me, and yet when it's convenient, do it another way, you will not be able. And it will bring a great deal of trouble to you, your family, for generations. It's not that God's going to smite everybody who doesn't do it right. It's that if you just simply put God right there in the center and treat God the way you approach God, the way you understand God, and what you do in your life as, as an example of who God wants all of us to be, when you do that, thousands of generations below you, if they carry this on, are going to do well. It is a way of doing well. I'm not saying you're going to be rich or famous or anything. I'm not going to say you're even going to be safe from harm, but your life will be good. And I think people miss the point when they are worried about the day-to-day -day and forget the fact that God's understanding of your life is much greater and much more expansive than your idea about your life. God has a better understanding of what's ahead than you do. And when God's the center of your life and you're living the way God wants, you don't have to worry. You can trust that God has got this. And that's what those first three verses mean. Trust God alone. Don't turn your head to other gods. They're there, but don't pay attention to them. They're not going to help you. They'll demand from you more than you can pay. And the last one. I want to keep going on that last one. Don't misuse the name of God. That's something we do a lot of, if you think about it. It's, it's when, we, when we advertise that we are a particular, we're Christian, and we go about and we live our lives, but we forget to live it with the intentionality of the fact that we are claiming Christianity, well, when you begin to alter the way you live so that your Christianity becomes an asset for you and not your devotion to God, when it becomes your slogan or your, 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 your personal idea of saying, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a good Christian, and then you proceed to live in a way that is not that way, that doesn't follow what Christ says, to love one another, to give to one another, to walk with one another, regard to love your enemies. If you're not doing all these things, but you are zealous for claiming your identity as Christian, then you're really, you're really right on the edge. In fact, if you haven't just stomped right into that third commandment, you're misusing God's name. Christianity is indelibly connected to God through Jesus Christ, whom we claim to be Messiah and Son of God. And it is very clear what Christianity means to most of the world, and it is very clear that most of the world is not seeing Christianity coming out of most Christians. That's why Christianity is losing favor in the United States. It's the main reason. Hypocrisy. We choose to use the name Christian as a label, as a tool, as a means to an end to convince you to trust me because I'm a good Christian. I go to church every Sunday. I tithe my everything I have for the church. It's the same phraseology you hear from Jesus in talking about 
those Pharisees that were not being good Pharisees. They were doing it for themselves, for the fame, for the popularity, for the power, for their own selfish ambition, as James says in the letter, for envy. I do it because I envy you who are righteous, so I will be righteous and get the same sort of respect you get. You see, that's, that's using God's name in vain. And to God's, to, the, to defile the name, that is to defile the name. James is very clear. When you do your work, you do it with the, the gentleness of wisdom from above. There are no big, you don't need to pronounce it. You don't need to announce it. You do not need to proclaim it or shine a light on it. You do it and it is to be gentle. It is to be loving. You are to serve with humility and you were to always understand that you do the best you can and you fail, it's okay. But if you're using this as a way to get something, to coerce someone, to whatever, something for yourself and not God's will, then you cross the line. Churches themselves are like that. We're in the middle of really, really, let's face it, really bad times. It's not just a virus. We have political insecurity. We have, we have racial tension to the point of aggression and violence. We have leaders in our own country that are, and others, and in other countries that are inciting extremists to acts of aggression and violence. We have an economy that if you don't measure it just by the, if you measure it by means other than a stock market, has a lot of people in trouble, has a lot of people in pain, and there's no real sign that it's getting better. We are in a real mess. It is evil having a heyday in this world. This is the world to which we are called as a church. This is when we actually really need to shake off our sense of, well, let's get back to normal and quit thinking that totally. There is no get back to with your faith in God through Jesus Christ. You are always becoming. You are always going toward something. And we are going to have to go toward being the community of faith that Christ has asked us to be. Which means we can't go back to the status quo of making church a part-time thing, making our faith a part-time thing, making space for God instead of asking God for help to find space to do something, to work, to be the good parent, to be the good child, to be the good friend. God made us for relationships. Anything that separates us is not of God. So the church must be there to bring together people to embrace people, to gather people, and to hold people together. And we're in the time that needs that now. No church should seek greatness. I'll read from, more from my notes. No church shall push achievement. No church should be based solely on programs. No church should seek to be independent or dominate other churches. When we do this, we are not behaving in a way that 
praises and glorifies God's name. When we do this, we defile God's name. We use God's name in vain. We must be the church that is humble, that is constant, that is present, that is always seeking to love and connect even when we have to do it six feet apart or more. And we are promised, both in James and and the commandments, that when we devote our lives to serve God in such th in that way, and our lives proclaim that very way of devotion, then we have nothing to worry about, and those who follow us have nothing to fear of the future. And together we will know God's presence and God's love. And that's it. And that's enough. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us once again go to God in prayer. All loving God, we are the unfortunate witnesses to unbridled evil. We see this evil enjoying great freedom to engender hatred within too many hearts through suffering. When a people's suffering goes unacknowledged and unattended, the result is rising frustration and anger. By such frustration and anger, evil continues to divide us and to move us to destroy one another. Bigotry, injustice, Oppression, greed, self-absorption, malignant apathy, and self-sought segregation from our fellow members of the family of God. All of these symptoms, and many others, tell us that evil is alive, well, and having a big time here on earth. Lord, you know that evil doesn't care who wins or loses as long as we are separated from one another. So you also know that evil is trying to obliterate your creation by pushing your children apart, often using your name as a rallying cry. And Lord, we know that all too often is through people in your church that through which evil cries the loudest. And so, God, we ask that you reteach all of us to share unconditional love with one another, to show genuine respect for one another, to embrace divine hope in the future, all through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then, God, we ask that you provide whatever is needed to jar us out of our frozen status quo, and into action, fully using the various talents, resources, and skills with which you have graced us and your community of faith. Then bring us together, strengthen to stand as one, and by our united action, demonstrate the ultimate power of your love bringing praise, honor, and glory to your name. God of compassion, we also ask you to heal the sick, comfort the distressed, befriend the friendless, and help the helpless. We particularly ask you to hear our prayers for Brenda, John, Jim, Jan, Tom, Art, May, Hunter, Ben, and Patricia, and those we name before you in the silence of our hearts. 
Give them strength, courage, and comfort in the trials they face, and a strong sense of your loving presence in their lives. Holy Spirit, look upon your church in this time of uncertainty and open our hearts to receive your grace and power. Kindle in us the fire of your love and strengthen our lives for service in your kingdom. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with each and every one of us now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>